If you're watching this and you do not know what EIS is, this is the wrong presentation. There is a EIS introduction, a basics of EIS presentation that is a good one to start with if you're not familiar with EIS. I'm going to assume that you know what EIS is, how it works for uh, uh, the remainder of this talk. The other thing is, this is for corrosion and coatings. It's also an introduction only. Um, this is a one hour presentation. It is not possible to learn EIS well enough uh, with just this little amount of instruction. Uh, this is ideal to figure out whether or not EIS is something worth pursuing. Also, if you've been using it and you want to know if there's some other things that may be little changes here or there, or things that you um, need to, to see about doing slightly differently, this might be helpful for that. Something like a full EIS course, like the one that Ray Taylor does, is a much better option if you really want to learn uh, uh, details on how to do EIS. That's a, I mean, that's a week worth of instruction. It's hands-on. Uh, this is just an hour, so we're just going to get an introduction, introducing uh, uh, how the technique gets applied to corrosion and coatings. So, with that, let's go ahead and begin. Electrochemical corrosion measurements in general. Uh, uh, corrosion is an electrochemical process, and so electrochemical techniques are, have been developed to, to measure corrosion rate. This is true for all of the different techniques, including EIS. And one of the central aspects, the starting point for all of these measurements is going to be the open circuit potential. The open circuit potential, or EOC, um, is this potential difference between a working electrode and a reference electrode with no net current flowing. The word net is important because uh, uh, corrosion is an active process. If there is corrosion, there is some current flowing, but it is internal. So nothing through the potentiostat. Um, this is the, the, the value of that potential, EOC, uh, is a mixed potential and it's determined by all of the half reactions within the electrochemical system, uh, not the instrument itself. Stable open circuit indicates that the corroding system is stable, has reached a steady state and that the experiment may begin. Uh, note here, steady state and equilibrium are not the same. Sometimes people mix up using them. Equilibrium uh, is nothing's changing. Steady state, it is. It is still undergoing active corrosion. It's just that it is at a constant rate. Um, if you start from an open circuit potential and apply a potential more positive of that value, you are going to accelerate the oxidation or corrosion reaction of the system. If you then bias the potential more negative of the open circuit, you're going to accelerate a reduction reaction. Um, the if you're looking at literature uh, 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 online, different uh, research, EOC and E core for corrosion potential can often be used interchangeably. Occasionally, there will be a, someone that will dis, uh, uh, make a discrepancy between the two, uh, a differentiation between the two. That EOC, the open circuit, is the measured open circuit potential before any experimentation has begun, and that E core is the corrosion potential that is measured during an experiment that is specific to things like TAFL or LPR uh, potentiodynamic um, because EIS doesn't do that slow transition through the, the open, we don't get that TAFL point, uh, you don't have that same uh, value with EIS that you get from these other those other types of techniques. The value of EOC isn't particularly useful as a predictive tool. It does tell you where a given material sits um, on the galvanic series, uh, but it doesn't tell you whether something is going to be more corroding or less corroding. It tells you whether or not it's more noble, but um, metals like uh, uh, alloys like stainless steels that corrode, that have very low corrosion rates don't have open circuit potentials that are particularly noble because the, the low corrosion rate is not dictated by the, the half reactions, but rather by the oxide film that forms. Um, so it is not useful necessarily as a, a predictor of how quickly something's going to corrode. Um, 
there's a catch to that with coatings, which will get mentioned at the very uh, uh, later on in this presentation. Um, so what is mixed potential theory? Mixed potential theory, uh, uh, here's a diagram here that shows, and these are uh, uh, sort of like a TAFL plot. So we've got two different chemical rea electrochemical reactions. Here we have hydrogen. Uh, on the, the upswing, it's being oxidized, and down here it is the hydrogen is being, protons are being reduced to hydrogen gas. And then down here is a second uh, uh, reaction, uh, and it's two half reactions. There's zinc oxidation and zinc reduction. This, these two points, these E0s, would be for an equilibrium position. But in a, a mixed potential case, what happens is the overall environment, both of these reactions are influencing the total potential that we see in the cell. And where they meet up here is the steady state. At this point, the zinc reaction, oxidation reaction, and the hydrogen or proton reduction reaction have the same rate. They've got the same current. So this is the I core value. And the potential at which that happens is the E core value. And in a, a well-behaved steady state corroding system, this E core is equal to the open circuit potential. And if you let a system uh, sit long enough to reach a steady state, it will eventually get to this point. Um, the other thing to note, and this comes back a little bit more to EIS, particularly <laughs> instead of uh, uh, electrochemistry in general, EIS, uh, circuit theory and impedance in general, requires a linear system response. Electrochemistry is not a linear system. Um, so what you see here is the, the electrochemical response as you change potential. and this doesn't work. This is nonlinear. We don't need that. However, the way that we get around this is by shrinking the size of the signal down to a magnitude where over which the response is linear. As this, if the uh, applied signal starts to get bigger and bigger, you can start to generate a nonlinear response that results in harmonics. Uh, this does not work for EIS. If you're doing EIS, harmonics are bad. That doesn't mean that those are necessarily bad things in general. There are, there is a, uh, this nonlinear region does in fact get utilized. There's a technique, uh, it's called electrochemical frequency modulation, uh, and this tech and this deliberately pushes into that nonlinear response region and utilizes those harmonics. Um, there's validation uh, you get uh, on this. It's causality factors, and the, the data comes back uh, uh, giving both beta values uh, from the Butler-Volmer and uh, um, RP, polarization resistance value, or uh, i -core. Um If you're familiar with other tech with DC techniques, this is basically effectively a non-destructive TAFL technique. Um, it looks like this, and uh, uh, Basically, two sine waves are applied on top of each other, so you see this response here uh, with two different frequencies applied, and this is deliberately pushing out into that nonlinear region, generating additional harmonics in the resulting signal that uh, uh, allow that allow for collection of useful information. This is the end of that because this is not actually EIS. This is all I'm going to uh, mention here for it. Um, it's a very useful technique, but it is not impedance. So let's go back to impedance. EIS for corrosion and coatings. Um, impedance range for corrosion and coatings is usually from a few tens of ohms to several giga ohms. Um, for corrosion, generally, we're looking to measure the polarization resistance value um, in the absence of other influencing factors that can affect uh, RP values measure with things like uh, polarization resistance. Um, the You can also get some information on pitting, passivation that can be identified with the IS. They do complicate the analysis. For coatings, insulating coatings measure model is very small capacitors when they're 
you know, new coatings, intact coatings, uh, barrier coatings. And so uh, uh, EIS for in those cases is often used in conjunction with stress to measure how coating surfaces change, break down. The systems as a whole, uh, corrosion and coatings can exhibit drift. You can have diffusion related events that can occur. Um, this is an accuracy contour plot. Uh, so this shows the total accurate range for a given system with a standard 10 millivolt or smaller signal. Most of what we're looking at for corrosion and coatings happens in these higher regions. Coatings live up near this capacitive limit. Um, Corrosion can actually get down fairly low if you're using very large area uh, electrodes. Um, you can actually see corrosion polarization resistances down into the milliohm, uh, but it's not common. And at laboratory scales, you tend to be ohms, tens of ohms, kilo ohms for those types of experiments. So. Here's some real data. This is a Bode plot. This is carbon steel aerated water with a thousand ppm chloride. Um, one thing to note: this is uh, uh, this is an older data set, and it you will see this sometimes where people flip the phase angle signs. Um, this is, happens a lot of times in science, where because people like to see things in a positive quadrant. Um, but if you take a look over here at the axis, this goes from zero to 60 degrees. The actual notation is really zero to minus 60 degrees. The phase angle has been flipped. Uh, capacitive phase angles are negative, not positive. Um, so this has just been flipped. If you're when you're running in our software, these phase angles will be plotted as an, in the negative quadrant. Uh, positive phase angles are representative of inductive behavior. But that said, uh, what we see here, high frequencies, we've got uh, our RU or uncompensated resistance out here. Uh, as we transition into lower frequencies, we start to see the phase deflects away from zero towards minus 90. Uh, and the impedance picks up as we move into this capacitive region here. And then at low frequencies, the, the impedance rolls off. The, this tends down towards zero degrees again. And this, uh, uh, we think about this flatlining. In this case, however, uh, this doesn't quite level off. It continues to go up at a slower angle than we see here. And instead of coming all the way back down to zero, the phase uh, turns around and comes up. We can see this a little bit better in the complex plane plot or the Nyquist of that same sample. So this is again the same data, but now we're looking at it in uh, on the Nyquist plot. And so at high frequencies, we've got our RU. We transition through the capacitive region, and at is low frequencies, instead of this semicircle completing all the way down to the axis here, it turns around and it goes out. This behavior uh, here and from the war and the uh, uh, as was seen on the Bode plot before is Warburg impedance. This is evidence of diffusion control at low frequencies. I should also note this is very noisy. This is uh, older data. You may run uh, if you were to run this test with modern equipment, it would not be as noisy as we're seeing uh, with uh, this region uh, uh, down at these lowest frequencies here. Okay, so there is another thing to bear in mind whenever you're doing these measurements, and that's how to get the best values. And one of the things that we're going to need to look at is that capacitance. So this data here is, uh, as noted, 430 stainless and sulfuric acid. And what we're looking at is that actual experimental data overlaid with the modeled uh, fitted uh, simplified Randall circuit. So this is a simplified Randall circuit. We've got uncompensated resistance uh, and then uh, it, a polarization resistance in parallel with a double layer capacitance. This is simplified because it doesn't have the diffusion. Diffu adding the diffusion control, the Warburg in here would give you, you the full Randall circuit. And what you can see here is that the best fit for this model doesn't look great. It, uh, it is a narrower 
and it is more semi. It, this is an actual semicircle. This has been flattened and broadened relative to what we're seeing with when we fit with this capacitor. And so what we do is, and, and, and what you are going to do with almost any real sample is substitute that capacitor for a constant phase element. And that constant phase element is shown here. And you can see the dramatic improvement in the fit that you get by using a constant phase element instead of a capacitor. And you need to do this for all real systems. There's a uh, uh, there will be some discussion at the end of exactly why this happens, but real systems are not ideal capacitors. And when you move into electrochemistry, especially on the corrosion front or with uh, where you've got a, a double layer capacitance, coatings can get close to ideal capacitance. But but when you when you've got an active sample uh, or an active electrode, um, you're going to see non-ideality on the capacitive front and you need to use a constant phase element to get a good fit for that and it's not just the fit looking better it's getting better numbers out of here so these are the model the the fit data for the the uh, Randall's version simplified Randall cell with a, a, a capacitor and the one with the constant phase element you've got an extra degree of freedom here so that gives us the better fit uh, this alpha value but what I want to look at because a lot of what corrosion is interested in is getting this RP value from that system is that there is a significant difference here and on those previous plots we the, the you could see that the they did not match up very well and so what we're seeing is that if you use the capacitor, you get one a, a very different value in this case for RP than if you use a constant phase element. Errors and variance in corrosion tends to be fairly large, so you want to have as little additional variance in your measurement and analysis side as possible. You want all of your your the 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 um, variance of standard deviation to be sample to sample and uh, uh, due to not instrumentation not fitting value so if you can get uh, improve your response the, the the measurement the, the value of that measurement and here we're about 12 here we're a little over 14 and a half uh, it's nearly a, a 25 uh, percent plus change in our RP value um, that is a significant difference, and it's this value is more representative of the actual RP value. So when we want to get those numbers, the constant phase element is just going to be a better way to do it. It's going to give better values. Okay, so because getting to RP is the thrust of most people that are doing EIS on for corrosion only, um, we're going to transition now a little bit from the only corrosion to the coating side of things and the reason that these two are bundled together is because a lot of coatings work in particular coatings that are evaluated using EIS are coatings that are barrier coatings used for corrosion prevention um, there are some experimental issues that we should need to address uh, regarding insulating coatings uh, the first one is that Barrier coatings have very high impedance, uh, especially early on, especially with thicker coatings or smaller areas. So this very high impedance means that you have very low cell currents and ex low currents can be experimentally difficult to measure. So a few things that need to be taken care of uh, uh, or taken into consideration. First off, uh, the potentiostat system that you're using needs to be one that is good for low current applications. How low is low current? Uh, coatings can easily get down into the pico, uh, pico amp level, sometimes even lower for that transition. Um, so very low current. The other thing is you may need to use a Faraday cage. Uh, Faraday cage is going to help reduce external noise in the system. Um, and 
a good rule of thumb is if your current levels get below a microamp, it's a good idea to have a Faraday cage. Some environments are going to be better, uh, lower ambient noise, and so they're better to go down to lower currents than others. But less than a microamp, probably a good idea to start getting a Faraday cage in the, the in for the measurements. That said, even cases where you've got a really good low current potentiostat, um, like the reference 600 plus and a Faraday cage, it's possible that those current signals are just too small. You may run up against the the capacitive limit of the system. You may run up again in, in, down into uh, just current measurement limitations. Uh, so there are a couple things that you can do. The first one, and this one. This is the only time I will ever recommend, as far as I know, this is probably the only time that I will ever recommend that you increase the AC amplitude for an EIS measurement. In general, 10 millivolts is kind of a practical limit because as these values are RMS, and so a 10 millivolt times 2 times the square root of 2 gives you the, the, the total. And at 10 millivolts, you're really at the practical limit for electrochemistry to maintain a linear signal. A little bit, you might be able to get away with a up to 15, but it's probably not worth going to for most cases. Codings are a special case because when you have an intact barrier coating, you actually don't have any electrochemistry happening. And so you're really just measuring the capacitive, capacitance across this coating. And in that case, going to an, a higher AC amplitude signal will give you more current signal back without actually inducing any of those nonlinear harmonics. It's still not the best idea in the world if you can avoid it. Uh, in the, the uh, right below that here, we can see uh, one possible way to get to around that. Uh, but if you're doing an intact coating and if you do not have any actual electrochemistry corrosion happening underneath, or if you're doing uh, uh, um, uh, four electrode freestanding film measurement, which we'll talk about later, um, then you can use a larger AC amplitude signal uh, and, and effectively get a, a more current signal back and make a, a better measurement that way. Another way to get more signal is to use a larger sample area. EIS uh, impedance in general, the way that it normalizes is not a division function. It actually, the, the, you normalize impedance data by multiplying by your electrode area. Uh, this means, among other things, that larger electrodes have lower impedance, not higher impedance. And since high impedance is, uh, 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 or which corresponds to very small capacitance, is the problem here. Using a larger area increases the capacitance, decreases the impedance, and may bring the signal down into a region that is easier to measure. Well, it will bring the signal down, hopefully enough to be in a region that's easier to measure. Uh, how large of a sample area? Um, our PTC1 paint test cell is 15 square centimeters, but I have seen cases of researchers uh, that use a fish tank where they've got a roughly, I don't know, foot and a half or you know 45 centimeter long section of eight inch maybe uh, a 20 centimeter diameter pipe with that has a thick asphalt coating on it you've got hundreds in some cases maybe even over a thousand square centimeters worth of active area and the reason for the large area is to increase the because with those very thick coatings even 15 square centimeters is invisible. You're looking at instrumentation artifacts. So you can go to very large sample areas uh, uh, and that will help knock that down to get uh, better. One of the other issues that comes up with coatings is something called capacitive drift. So because a barrier coating that is intact uh, behaves like a capacitor and because all electronic systems uh, potentia stats, have uh, the, uh, uh, this electrometer in there that's required for making these measurements has a bias or an input current. That tiny current, which I mean, picoamps, maybe less, 
isn't zero. And because that very, very, very slow current, when you put that into a very, very, very small capacitor, you can actually charge it up to relatively high voltages in a short period of time. Um, and so what happens is if you try and measure open circuit potential of a barrier coded sample, you don't ever see stabilization. In fact, what you tend to see is that the potential just very consistently and gradually increases in magnitude. It could go up or down depending on the, the direction of the bias in the current uh, of the input current. But um, it will just slowly rise over time until it hits the uh, uh, potential measurement limitation of the, the system, and which can point it overloads. So you cannot measure open circuit on an intact barrier coating. The way, but you do want to use open circuit as your center point. And so the way that we do this is that instead of measuring open circuit on the coating itself, you're going to measure the open circuit potential of the metal substrate, just the bare metal that is underneath that coating. You measure the open circuit value of that, and then you use that measured EOC as a DC voltage offset uh, uh, for your coding measurement. And so that's what you do for those initial measurements. After that, eventually, as the coding deteriorates, you will be able to measure a stable open circuit potential uh, once the uh, you can see the pore resistance at low uh, uh, at uh, low frequencies, you can usually start to see a stable open circuit potential. And at that point, you use the measured open circuit potential. So how do you do this? So EIS itself is a very sensitive detector of coding conditions. So what we tend to look at is relative changes in a single coding. And a lot of times, what you're, you're going to want some type of stress mechanism to induce failure in between your EIS measurements. EIS is non-destructive, so you can track the failure or deterioration with time. So this is a basic model of a coded surface. Uh, a, uh, coded surface. This is the equivalent circuit model for uh, uh, a coded surface. This is in there. It's the standard model. Uh, there's a, a REAP, REAP2 CPE that uh, uh, substitutes these two capacitors for constant phase elements, which you will probably want to do. So first thing is we have our Randall cell for our corrosion, the, 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 the corrosion reaction Randall cell that we looked at before, uh, simplified Randall cell. Here's our uncompensated resistance. Here's our corrosion reaction. We've got a double layer capacitance and a polarization resistance. But in order to get to this corrosion reaction that happens on the metal surface, we've got to go through a coating. And so we've got another pair of circuit elements here that are necessary. The first one is we've got a coating capacitance. And this is um, at some level the, the it is between the outside of the surface and the metal, but uh, it, this is our coating capacitance. Then there is a pore resistance. And this pore resistance is it's not necessarily a specific single pore, but it's more the how electrolyte moves through there. You can think of it like a torturous path, but basically the pore resistance allows the electrolyte out here to slowly make its way through the coating. And it's got to get through this pore resistance before it gets to the metal underneath and initiates any corrosion reaction. So I should note, this is the model for a coated surface. But when you actually run these experiments, you may not and probably will not see all of these elements in your data. And if you do not have them in your data, you should not be using them when you model. In fact, for a brand new intact surface, we'll see in a minute, uh, you might see a uncompensated resistance depending on what frequency you go up to. But there's a very good chance that all you will see is coding capacitance. And so you don't want to use this whole model to measure a system, to model a system and fit a system that is only showing the coding capacitance. That's all you need is going to be this element, probably this as well, and nothing more.
as you start to see pore resistance, you can add this into your fit, but you do not want to add any of these corrosion reactions in there until you start to see those as well. These coatings tend to be microns to tens of hundreds of microns, but even one micron is already uh, almost 10,000 fold greater than what we've got for the double layer capacitance. So this coating capacitance is much smaller. This resistance is modeled, is uh, talked about as poor resistance. This isn't necessary. This this doesn't necessarily mean an actual physical poor. It's a torturous path. It's just the way that electrolyte has to make its way through the coating itself, and that basically acts as a bigger resistor. So electrolyte that's out here that wants to get down to the surface of the metal has to figure out how to get through this coating, and that looks like models like a resistor. Um, for an intact brand new coating, this pore resistance may be so large that you don't even see it and all we see is the coating capacitance. Um, and I'll, we'll take a look at some of the degradation here in a minute. So uh, this, this is the model for a coating independent of any information. Once you actually go and run an experiment, if, you do, if your data does not have enough information to model all of these, you don't want to use this entire model for every sample that you've run. Um, and so let's take a look at how uh, uh, coding degrades, theoretically, in principle. So um, degradation is, uh, uh, we're going to talk about five different stages. This is a general case and helpful for visualization. So. Stage one, brand new, intact coating. It's, it's been painted on, sprayed on, and allowed to cure however that is necessary. You put it into the cell and you immediately measure, immediately within a minute or so, measure an EIS spectrum. What do you see? You see a capacitor. The phase is locked at minus 90 degrees. The impedance magnitude is just increasing in a straight line. Uh, uh, this is the Bode plot. If you want to look at the Nyquist plot, it's even harder to discern anything because it starts at zero, zero and goes straight up. It doesn't actually start at zero, zero, but uh, um, if you can measure, get a measure of uncompensated resistance, but it's pretty close to that. Uh, and on this scale, you wouldn't be able to distinguish between the two of them. <clears throat> so that's stage one. Stage two is we sit in that electrolyte solution for some period of time. And what happens is the electrolyte penetrates into the coating a little bit. Stage two is water uptake. Stage two looks a lot like stage one. And so I'm gonna have to go back and forth here a little bit if you didn't notice a difference. We're still at minus 90, this is still increasing. But let's take a look at the intercept over here. We're uh, 1.8, 1.9 giga ohms on stage two. And if we go back to stage one, you see that we're about 10 times higher. And so this higher impedance, because we're purely capacitive in both cases, means that our capacitance has gotten, is, is smaller here. High impedance means small capacitance. So in stage one, what's happened is the intact coating doesn't have any electrolyte in it, and so you're basically measuring the dielectric of the coating itself with no water penetrated into it. In stage two, we have filled that coating, all the pores in the coating, the electrolyte has penetrated into them, and so what's happened is those the ions within the electrolyte have gotten closer to the surface, uh, you've changed the dial, it's basically changed the dielectric of the coating material itself. And that has given, that, that means that our capacitance gets larger and our impedance gets smaller. So that's what's happened between stage one and two. In stage two, we st the, the, the water uptake, the water, the electrolyte has not gotten all the way to the metal surface underneath. It's still within the coating. The coating is still providing its, its barrier qualities here. Um, 
but that's what's happened in those first two. Uh, again, the Nyquist looks very boring, straight line up. And, and again, these are these are model data. Uh, uh, real coatings uh, are not going to be purely capacitive. They're not going to be down at minus 90, though they do get close. They can be in that, you know, minus 87 range. After you get some water uptake, that phase angle tends to drift down and you get down into the minus 80 uh, to minus 70 range. But again, that's that, that will vary coating to coating based on coating thickness and all sorts of other things. Um, so this is model. This is like a, a, a theoretical idea of it. And you won't, it won't actually be straight up and down. It would be at a slight angle out here. Uh, not quite that severe. Um, stage three, this is where the first time something else has happened. And that's where we see poor resistance. At high frequencies, and it's not shown here because this is only going up to 10 kilohertz, you, you may have a roll off for RU and then capacitance. But now in stage three, we actually have a roll off and we get a measurement of the pore resistance. There's still no corrosion happening in this case. This is just saying that at this point, the coating is either loosened up or damaged or just there's been enough uh, uh, time for penetration thing, events that now we can actually get a measure of the impedance of the coating for ions moving in and out of it. Whereas before the ions were basic in stage two, they were in there, but they were effectively static and just causing our capacitance to get larger. In this one, they're moving in and out. And that's what we're measuring in this, this uh, uh, pore resistance. This value is giving us uh, ion movement through the, the coating itself. And again, our Nyquist now looks like a standard Randall cell. Uh, uh, we, we, we still only have the one time constant. There is no corrosion happening. This is just poor resistance. Uh, but it, it looks a little bit more like what we think of with EIS spectra, with simple data. So now that we have a poor resistance at some of these lower time scales, we can actually start to see corrosion happening. And that's where stage four comes in. So, in stage four, uh, we've got uh, the pore resistance, we've got our coating capacitance, but now underneath that coating, we start to see corrosion initiation. And so that's what we get on these two plots. So we've got our coating capacitance, pore resistance. Now there's a double layer capacitance that gets added and a corrosion resistance that is at, on top of that. Um, the resistance value for this corrosion resistance is not going to be the same as what you see for a bare metal. It's going to be much, much, much higher. It, the reason isn't because the metal substrate underneath is less prone to corrosion. The reason is because the effective area that is subject to corrosion is much, much, much smaller. The difficult, and that's, that's in part due to the difficulty of transporting the ions to and from the surface, and also because damages for a coating may be localized. And so the entire coated surface, you don't see dam you don't see corrosion everywhere underneath. It's just happening in little spots here and there. Um, and there's a lot of resistance to drive the, the, the charge through there. So even where it does happen, it has a tendency to have a very high resistance value. Um, the uh, uh, Nyquist plot for the same data. We have now two semicircles. Um, the size of these semicircles uh, has nothing to do with the magnitude of the capacitance and everything to do with the magnitude of the respective resistances. When these are uh, more balanced, you, they tend to flatten out a bit. Um, but we do see two time constants here fairly easily. Stage five is major damage. Stage four and five look very similar in terms of this model data. Uh, the difference is very similar to between one and two. Here, we're looking at 100 kilo ohms. When we go back, we're looking at 10 mega ohms. So we've come down uh, a couple orders of magnitude here on the impedance, which means uh, lower impedance uh, for capacitance means it's bigger. For resistance, it means that the resistor is smaller, which means the corrosion rate is faster. So we've actually got more corrosion current happening here. And uh, this one's actually nicely labeled for us. So you can see we've got coating capacitance that levels off with a pore resistance plus 
RU, which we're not showing. And then we move through a, a double layer capacitance. And, and at low frequencies, we finally see RP plus four plus RU. Um, and the Nyquist for this looks like a lot like the last one, uh, just the, the magnitudes for the impedance again are different here. Uh, but this little guy here is from our coding, and then this larger one is the, the double layer capacitance. And so we get all that information out of here. So that's in general short terms how the uh, uh, coding breaks down. That is very simplified. Uh, real coatings, you may never see this far. Your uh, uh, Some coatings may exist mostly in between stage one and stage two with occasional pops into stage three. Um, coatings that are deliberately marred or designed to, to fail in different mechanisms, you may see some corrosion initiation. Um, but that is a, a, a general overview of kind of where things can sit for barrier coatings on an active metal substrate, something like a mild steel. How these are done in practice is for a lot of those coatings, uh, time to failures can be in the order of years. So if you measure an impedance and you measure an imped another impedance, way, you may go years before you actually start to see anything other than a little bit of water uptake uh, uh, for good quality coatings. That's what you expect. And so instead of, uh, for well, not just good quality, it depends on the, the nature and the design of the coating. And, uh, but for some coatings, you would expect not to almost see any changes versus time if all you're doing is EIS. And so there are different things to do. Well, one of them is uh, monitoring. Uh, 0 0.1 hertz, uh, that is selected because it has a tendency to, it, it's slow enough that you can get relative, that, that you start to see a lot more, a, a lot of changes happen uh, more dramatically at lower frequencies, but it's also still fast enough that you don't, that you're not waiting hours for each new data point. So you can use it as a monitor uh, versus time. EIS can also get combined with all sorts of other testing. So cabinet tests, so it, it, and the EIS is not done in the cabinet. Uh, it goes into the cabinet for subject, then it comes out and EIS is measured, goes back in. Thermal cycling, very similar. Uh, the EIS is, not, it, it is done in between rounds of thermal cycling. Uh, rapid electrochemical assessment of paint. Uh, this is a whole test. There's an application note on the subject, and it's, I'm going to go through some of these here uh, uh, shortly. Um, AC, DC, AC. AC is an impedance test. DC is something like cathodic disbonding, and then AC is another impedance test. A uh, final note here for freestanding films, uh, which are measurements of coatings that do not have substrates behind them. And there's a couple, uh, 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 there's, you, you sort of simplify the measure and sometimes can be more sensitive for uh, uh, some types of materials. So the immersion and measurement at the 100 millihertz is a fairly straightforward. You just measure an EIS spectrum, uh, system goes into an oven and you remeasure at different time intervals and you plot that versus time. And if your uh, plot uh, uh, slope is greater than seven, you've got adequate corrosion protection. Uh, uh, so uh, that comes from, this is uh, what you're taking a look at here. So these are showing complete EIS spectra at different values. Uh, but what you would actually be tracking is this 100 millihertz point right here. So this is the one, and you can see that at these higher frequencies, the coating changes a little bit. It's just not nearly as dramatic. So you get a much, it's, it's a lot easier to distinguish the, the changes that you see at these lower frequencies. Thermal cycling, uh, accelerating the failure by using some increased temperature, uh, cycle and measure at uh, 35, 55, 75, 85, then sequence back to room temperature. And so 
you always see a change when this cha when, when you increase the temperature. So as it, when the the when you make measurements at higher temperatures, the you the the higher temperature causes the coating to swell. It lets uh, uh, electrolyte penetrate into the coating much more easily. And so as you go from room temperature to elevated temperature, you expect this impedance to drop. What you want to happen with a good quality with for for this type of uh, test is that as you when you reverse and you go back up to room temperature, that the data is on top of itself. So there's open circles and closed circles here. So coming down and then going back up, what we see is the at each temperature there, it's still on top of each other. So when we get back to room temperature, the behavior of the coating is the same as it was before the thermal cycling. For an irreversible test, this is what you see. So you start at one point and then when we come down and then when this is reversed, there is a difference. Uh, the, the coating does not recover as well as it started. Uh, so this has suffered damage through the thermal cycling. It's not good for that. The rapid electrochemical assessment of paints or REAP test is um, a combined test. You actually take two samples. One is just going to have EIS measurements done on it, and the other is a cathodic disbonding test. Uh, I'm not sure if this is still the only one, but it's the only one that uh, uh, we that know of in terms of any types of uh, uh, standard practice that combines EIS and a physical test. Um, the EIS data gets modeled according to the, the previous models that we have, and the cathodic despondent sample is measured for despondent. Uh, R-core percent water uptake pullback are then used to estimate a time to failure. The way this test works, we've got two samples. Uh, sample A is unscribed, sample B is scribed. Sample A is, the EIS is measured at time zero to get uh, uh, an initial capacitance, uh, coding capacitance. And then this unscribed sample sits in the electrolyte for 24 hours. During that 24 hours, the scribed sample is subjected to cathodic despondent. So after 25, after 24 hours, there's a, a tape, uh, sorry, tape lift, and you measure how much pullback you get on the scribe sample. Divide that by two because it's being pulled back on both directions. Uh, and at 24 hours, you measure the unscribe. You measure EIS again on the unscribed sample, uh, and get a secondary uh, uh, coating capacitance and extrapolate to get an R core value. This one's a little bit tricky. Um, from there, you can calculate. Uh, so you get the DXCT is the pullback from the scribe sample. The the percent water has to do with the shift in the coating capacitance between time zero and time 24. And then our time to failure calculation. Um, this uh, um, test is uh, uh, was developed by Martin Kendig. He's still active in the field, actually, for the full week-long EIS course. He teaches. Um, uh, uh, he does. He, he, he's one of the lecturers there, and the uh, it, it's it's a 24-hour test that gives you a quick time to failure. This is much 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 faster than most other tests, um, and so it becomes fairly useful uh, for a lot of coatings evaluation uh, people doing initial screenings. Couple other techniques, AC, DC, AC. So in this case, we this is uh, going to measure condition of con coding before and after electrochemical desponding. In this case, we're going to measure EIS and then cathodically polarize that same sample that we are measuring. In the REAP test, we 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 just measured e the the unscribed sample never had any potential applied to it other than the EIS and it just had that done twice. The scribed sample is the one that was cathodically polarized. In this case, we do not scribe, but you cathodically polarize the sample and measure EIS again and repeat. Um, the data, 
again, look similar to the others, whereas where if you increase the amount of cathodic desponding, you, you shift this uh, down. Now, what you will see here on this side is that the coating itself is not seeing a lot of water uptake, or at least not a meaningful amount. And so what we're doing is the desponding is causing this to, to pull away from the surface and let um, electrolyte penetrate. It, it, this test likely was started with something that was already had water uptake so that we, you don't see, so the coating itself is the same as it always is. It's just that now this pore resistance has dropped down very low. Um, Freestanding films. So freestanding film is giving information on just a paint film. It's a four terminal, four electrode measurement. Um, and so in this case, you can actually take a look and evaluate the movement of ions water without the complications of what happens when those get to the metal substrate underneath. So normally with a, a, with a painted surface, a coating, on a metal substrate, after a given period of time, that the the, code, the electrolyte that is getting through is causing corrosion underneath, and that does a couple of things. One, it gives you corrosion products on the backside of the coating, which may or may not be good. The other is that it gives a very big change in the signal, so you start getting all this corrosion data for the what's underlying there in no longer getting any information about uh, what's happening with the coating. So by separating the coating from the metal substrate and measuring across this cell, we actually can get, you, or you can get, you can get a, 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 a data that only has that coating. So it never looks like anything more than phase one, two, three, because that phase four, that corrosion initiation in five, you never see by separating these out, by moving to a four electrode measurement, um, you can do that. Uh, the changes that you see, we see here can occur faster. Uh, we're driving them through. You can use a larger potential to do that. Um, the, uh, uh, the setup for this is a little bit different. They use what's called an H cell. So um, do I have a... I think I do. So an H cell looks something like this. Where you fill the electrolyte up to here, your coating, your painted coating sample goes in between the two. And then let's And then we put a big counter electrode here and here. And these get connected on the gamma ray potentiostat to the counter lead and to the working lead. And then we get two reference electrodes that come in closer to this surface. Oop, that went a little low. Oh, that's fine. And so these are two reference electrodes maybe just wires, but usually uh, uh, better to use actual reference electrodes here. And these large counter electrodes can be graphite or platinum, just something low impedance that carries the current. So you connect working, working sense, reference, and counter across these four different electrodes. And now we're only measuring the potential drop across this surface. So the electrochemical reaction that's happening here and that's happening here, we never See. And so this is what a four electrode measurement looks like. This is a, a H cell. Um, and the, there's actually be a clamp to clamp up together across this. Um, but this is how this measurement is uh, uh, made. This is what the, the data is going to look like. Again, it looks very similar to all these other ones. Uh, this one, uh, the others did not go down to the point of seeing corrosion resistance. Uh, or, or, or any corrosion uh, data in the, the, the samples, this one will never show corrosion data. So we're just looking at uh, uh, changes in the pore resistance and changes in capacitance across the, the coating without any complication from the underlying metal. So um, 
in conclusion here, EIS is uh, very useful for understanding coding degradation. Uh, and there's a lot of different approaches. They all have merit. Uh, there is a kind of try and figure out what were and which one works best uh, for you. This is generally only useful for metal coated samples as opposed to wood coatings where, well, wood's not very conductive, so it makes it hard to use that as a, a, a substrate. Um, I say in general because you can take a, a coating for something other than metal, uh, plastic or wood coating and do that freestanding film test and get uh, evaluate uh, those type of coatings in that way. Um, the, oh, oh, where'd it go? Um, a large batch of reference, uh, uh, references here for EIS. Um, again, I wanna emphasize this is a very uh, much like introduction, what these different numbers mean. A lot of the, the, the most useful aspects, things that you really need to know if you're doing EIS of coatings, uh, things like open circuit potential, how to make that measurement when you have a, a passive film on the surface that leads to capacitive drift. Um, for corrosion, and really for coatings, but for corrosion in particular, you absolutely wanna use constant phase elements instead of capacitors if you want to get accurate values back. Uh, in fact, constant, uh, uh, the constant phase element is almost always what you want to use. Uh, capacitors, uh, real systems are very rarely uh, close enough to an ideal capacitor to, to really get good use out of a, a capacitor element. Um, but the capacitor is easy for easier for people to understand. A lot of times you have uh, reviewers or others that want to, it's like, well, what does that mean in terms of capacitance? And sometimes it's that uh, uh, drop in becomes helpful. Um, but in terms of getting better data out, you don't want to use that. Um, and with that, I think I'll open it up and uh, see what questions have been presented. I will exit out of, oop, discard this, and uh, see what questions we have. Okay, thank you, Jacob, for that. Um, we've, we have a number of uh, questions, and again, to everybody uh, that has asked a question, we're trying to pose the more general questions to Jacob so that it's more relevant for more people. If you if you've sent a specific question to the co-hosts or to me, then we'll try to answer that uh, privately through an email follow-up uh, if we haven't already answered that. So uh, I think the first general question uh, that a couple of people have, have asked is, um, if we go back to, you know, from the mathematical point of view, the constant phase element is okay, but is there a physical meaning to Y zero and alpha and how might we interpret those parameters? Okay, uh, you got muted, Jacob, is that? Uh, are you okay? Right, that was better. Okay, sorry. I, I was I was trying to figure that out. I apologize. I missed the mm -hmm. question. Okay. Okay. The question is uh, from a, it's about a constant phase element, and in general, is um, you know you add a constant phase element to make a better fit, but is there a physical meaning to y zero and alpha, and how might you interpret those parameters? So yes is the, the short answer. There is a physical meaning to those. Um, in terms of how to think about this. So if you take a theoretical, so a, a, a capacitor is actually a theoretical element. It assumes an infinite plane. It assumes atomically perfectly flat substrate. Uh, the, the potential across the, the voltage across the entire surface is exactly the same and the distance separating the, the two charge carrying plates is uniform across that entire distance. All of those break down with every real capacitor, but 
for a lot of capacitors, especially thicker ones from coatings or from like a paper or mylar film capacitor, they don't break down enough for, for, for that deviation to be visible. Uh, with electrochemistry, they do, and they break down in a few different ways. First off, our, we're, we don't have an infinite uh, plane. When you're talking about you know, square centimeters, you're close enough, so that's not the biggest effect. When you get down to microelectrodes or micropores or other things like that, you can actually, that, that area gets, there, there's a, there's a, you get an edge effect that causes uh, discrepancies. The other one is it's not perfectly smooth. The surface has some roughness to it. <clears throat> when you put a mill thick coating or uh, a micron to tens or hundreds of micron thick coating on that surface, you may not care that that is not perfectly flat because at, by the time you put a, a you know, a thousand angstroms or uh, 10,000 angstroms worth of stuff on top of it, the, you know, nanometer level roughness that you have maybe doesn't matter too much. Um, but if you don't have that coating, then that roughness is significant. Even if it's polished very, very mirror smooth, you still have a roughness that's on the order of nanometers and nanometers worth of roughness to an angstrom thick double layer capacitor is still very large. And so that's a break from the ideality. Um, the last thing, and this one does more apply to the coatings, uh, if you lay up a double layer capacitor, the actual thickness across that is actually fairly uniform. But when you put a real coating on a surface, it may not be. You can have, right, you, it, depending on exactly how the coating is deposited and things like that, uh, it, you you're probably have some areas that are a little bit thicker than others. Even if it's really, really, really uniform, it's still not perfect. Uh, and so th there is going to be a little bit of discrepancy based on that. Um, so all of those other, all of these type of things, they add in, in uh, uh, non-ideality to the surface. Um, it's one of the reasons that it, it becomes very difficult to measure across samples and why you need a lot of different samples, especially for coatings, um, because one, you take two samples that are nominally have the exact same prep and you can get different values. And where you'll see that show up uh, for, for coatings work has a tendency to be in the alpha side of things. Um, but in terms of what that physically means, yes, there's a distribution. Um, but the way I'm going to, uh, it, 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 it comes back to uh, theory related to like a porous electrode. Um, and don't really go into that because porous electrodes in general are not uh, common uh, for, for corrosion coatings work. Um, but what happens is if you have a pore, as you move charge into that pore, uh, there's this differential resistance and capacitance. So at any point, there's a resistance and a capacitance to the wall of the pore or to keep going down. And because some of those charges are going to pull off to the wall, you actually, the, as you go down, both the capacitance and the resistance change. So the amount, the, the, the relative impedance to go deeper and deeper into a pore changes because the environment changes. Uh, and a pore is an easy way to kind of conceptualize it because it's uh, 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 transmission lines are the the transmission line element is the the you know end end for that. But um, but because it's easy to to see that as you go down, there are different paths to take for a given ion, and and moving it through shifts and causes the potential to drop through the channel and things like that. So the potential isn't uniform. The same thing happens with a real electrode, just in a very different way. Um, in addition to that, with uh, uh, for non-coated samples, if you're looking at corrosion, you've got different active zones based on alloying, based on oxide film formation, things like that, which means that you have different levels of activity across the surface of the electrode. And at some level, a constant phase element is kind of a, a fudge factor to deal with all of those non-idealities, all of that distribution. It, it, it's a distributed element. And because the act, an actual electrode surface, no matter what uh, one you're, type, you're dealing with, it's going to have 
idealities that's going to give you this distributed surface. And that is what this constant phase element does. In term, the, 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 the two parameters for the constant phase element, um, the alpha value is really the one that tells you a bit about how much I, variance you've got from ideality. If alpha is one, it's a perfect capacitor. If it's zero, it's a perfect resistor. If it's 0.5, it is one of, there, there are a couple of different things that give you 0.5. Uh, diffusion is a 0.5. Um, but a perfectly symmetrical and configured pore also gives you 0.5. So when you have a rougher surface or you've got more uh, uh, different pathways through different parts, so whether it's a coating or an oxide film or whatever, um, you can start to see things in that 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 range. It's not porous. But the distribution is having a similar effect to what porous would be for an ideal surface. Um, it, there, uh, the, the, there, there is a, a couple different ways to calculate, to convert from the constant phase element values to, the, um, to a capacitance. But it does require knowing what type of non-idealities are dominating um, your system to pick the right one. Uh, so in general, it's better to report Y and alpha rather than uh, to convert that to a capacitor, um, even when people want you to, uh, because you're making assumptions when you make that conversion. Um, but yes, it does reflect real things. Uh, in different systems, you're getting different aspects of what non-idealities are getting reflected there. Okay, thank you. Uh, let's see, the next general question. Um, when we're actually acquiring data, how can we tell if our response is linear or not? Well, if you're watching it, uh, and if you're not using fast mode on one of our systems, uh, you should have a list, you'll have a list issue that pops up. At high frequencies, it may be flashing faster than you can see, which is mostly fine because at high frequencies, you're less likely to have uh, uh, nonlinear responses. But at low frequencies, and uh, let's see if I can get that back up and pop a scratch pad on here. I should have just put a blank slide. Um, so at, God, it's harder to draw with this. Uh, let me go back to that view. So I need that one. Okay. So at, when you're doing, I can't really see that. You should get one of two things. You should get, wow, that looks, okay. Let's pretend that that isn't quite as lumpy as it, it, it looks. You should get either an ellipse or you should get a straight line, which is also not that straight. <laughs> what, you should not, it, it, what you should not see are any of a number of wavy ellipses, uh, things that look like uh, bananas or crescent moons, um, something that looks like it's squared off. Uh, the, these are all bad. Um, so this should, be, this should be a nice smooth ellipse at an angle, and this should be a straight line. Uh, so these two things, that's funny, uh, are what you should see. Uh, if you see something that's wavy, there's two things. First off, if you see that kind of, it could be from noise, it could be from nonlinearity. If you want to distinguish between the two, watch whether or not it's getting better. If you've got a wavy response on top of your ellipse, or not a wavy response, but like a noisy response on the ellipse, if that noise is converging and getting less and less and less and it's getting closer to a true ellipse, then it's noise. If it does not, if it may, it, if as the noise gets lower, if, as the measure goes on, it keeps having those same uh, oscillations and uh, whether that's the crescent moon or wavy thing, if that is 
then it's being reinforced, which means that it's a harmonic that's being generated. And so in that case, it is a nonlinear response. Um, there are a couple other things that, are, that aren't due to nonlinearity, but due to drift. Uh, so if this ellipse starts and then comes around, and when it comes back up, it doesn't meet up with itself, but it comes in here, and it's basically spiraling downward or to the side, depending on what whether you're doing potentiostatic or galvanostatic. But if this ellipse is somewhat spiraling, if it doesn't meet up with itself, that means that your system is drifting in the background. Um, drift is problematic as well. Uh, uh, didn't really talk about it too much today, but uh, samples do drift, uh, real uh, uh, specimens. And uh, uh, if you're seeing drift, it probably means that your open circuit didn't fully stabilize before you ran. Uh, you do not tend to see it with capacitive, with uh, uh, capacitive coatings uh, because that input current is being canceled out by the fact that we're actually doing an AC measurement on top that is much bigger. And so everything just gets anchored fairly well to the correct potentials. Um, it's a potentiostatic measurement. Uh, so you don't see that, that, that uh, drift much for uh, uh, barrier coatings, but you can see it uh, at lower frequencies for corrosion. Okay, thank you. Uh, we had a couple questions about conductive coating. So you can imagine something like uh, sacrificial zinc in there or perhaps a uh, filler like uh, graphene. So how might, the, how might the spectra for a coating, a conductive coating change compared to a purely capacitive coating or an insulating coating? Well, the first thing to start with is conducting coatings or conversion coatings, they're not barrier coatings. So they have a tendency to look more like corrosion uh, data uh, than they do like the coating data that was presented here. Um, and exactly how that changes is going, uh, you've, it, it is a much more complex system. It is gonna have a more complex response. Um, uh, the initial data is, though, is going to look more like a corrosion system than it is like a coating system because you have active electrochemistry happening there. The, you are also going to see differences based on whether or not that uh, uh, active coating is one that's designed to also completely seal off the underlying substrate or if it exists where the electrolyte sees both of those at the same time. So you, you, the, the, that mixed potential theory going back there, your open circuit, that actually might be a better indicator at, at least at start whether or not a, a, an active coating system, what kind of coating and coverage and things like that you've got. <clears throat> because if all you have, if the only thing that the electrolyte sees is your active coating, that's going to dominate the open circuit potential. However, if you've got a coating that also that allows the electrolyte to penetrate down to the underlying substrate, then you're going to have an open circuit that is a mixture between the coating and the underlying substrate. Uh, you, it'll still tend to get dominated by the coating because in those cases, you want that to be uh, uh, the one that's driving things. If it's the underlying substrate, you still have corrosion happening there. Um, but it is, it's more like evaluating a corrosion system than it is like evaluating these coding systems. Um, but I will say that the open circuit potential and change in RP versus time are probably going to be two things that are more relevant to you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. We have another, another good question that's, that should be applicable for a lot of people, and it's about uh, barrier coatings or insulating coating. And which setup would you recommend to use, a three electrode setup or a two electrode setup? Three, almost always. Uh, uh, three electrode isolates just your working electrode. No matter what that working electrode is and what you're doing, you're better off with a, a three electrode system than a two electrode system. Two electrode adds an additional electrode barrier junction that you are going to be measuring current injection through. Um, for most coatings, that second electrode is so low impedance that it doesn't really register for barrier coatings. For corrosion, it's really bad to have it because you can have your, your uh, counter electrode can have an uh, impedance that's on the same order of magnitude as your corrosion 
corroding electrode, your active electrode. Uh, so for active coatings and for corrosion, two electrode is really complicating things. It's get, it's adding into your measurement. You aren't. It makes it a lot harder to disentangle. For coating, for barrier coatings work when it's intact, it's less problematic, but it is still a complicating factor. Uh, you do still have, especially if you're using, well, it depends on what you're using for that, that counter electrode. Um, but in any case, you are measuring the impedance of the counter electrode into the electrolyte, then resistance to the electrolyte, and then the impedance of the working electrode. So you're always, you, you've added complexity to the system even if you your overall impedances make it you don't really see much of it it's uh generally a bad practice because you're you even if you don't see it initially you might get to the point where it is affecting your system and you may not know that if you're doing two electrode you would only know that if you were doing a three electrode measurement to uh, compare it to okay thank you um Let's see, we have another more general question here. Is there a way that you can tell in the spectra when you lose adhesion? Maybe. Um, again, that's not necessarily uh, as straightforward because it really depends on the nature. If you've got an air bubble that forms underneath, so, so if you've lost adhesion, but you don't have solvent penetration, it may actually cause your capacitance to get a little bit smaller instead of larger because now there's a bigger gap down there. But whether or not you're going to be able to, uh, to, to see that and measure it is, is, hard, is tough. Now, if there's additional damage or if the water uptake is enough that you've got penetration underneath that, then absolutely, because you will all of a sudden, you'll, that, that the double layer capacitance is much uh, uh, larger capacitance uh, and lower impedance per unit area than your coating capacitance probably is. So, if there's some, if that adhesion is combined with enough uptake that you actually that that, that the backside has gotten filled in with electrolyte, then you will definitely see that. But if it's just bubbling up a little bit, maybe maybe not. That's that that. It, that's going to be a whole system uh, uh, test. And I know I've seen uh, videos of can liners uh, with carbonated beverages where there's a little bit of uh, uh, penetration of the, the, the carbon dioxide. Uh, the, the carbon dioxide itself can get through the coating, but the electrolyte can't. And so when the, the can is open and depressurized on the outside, all of a sudden, all the, the, that big pressure change causes that... Um, or pressure drop causes the the coating to bubble up. That coating is still intact, but now, but the, the 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 CO2 has gotten behind it and pushes it away from the wall. So, uh, and, and whether or not you can see that with EIS prior to opening the can, uh, I I don't have a good answer for. Okay. Uh, I think this is probably a good place to stop. Then um, I know there was some. There's, oh, wait, hold on. I see one more. Um, okay, no, that's a pretty specific question. So I will say, let me share my screen here. Oh, I need to stop sharing. There you go. Yeah. Okay, so, um, there, there's there's uh, some very specific questions in chat which we didn't get to, but the chat is saved. And what we'll do is we'll follow up with people individually. Uh, we have your email addresses and we'll send you that. I also wanna say that we can make these slides available in a, in a uh, PDF format that we will send a link to. Also at the same time, we will send a video uh, or link to the video recording of this uh, for you. Um, I wanna thank everybody for sticking around uh, and attending this webinar. Remind everybody to stay safe and, and stay healthy. And lastly, I just want to say that um, we have more webinars available at uh, on our website. So the link is provided there for you to go to. You can register for our next webinars, uh, you know, get in so that um, 
you know, if it fills up to capacity, we can only handle so many attendees. So make sure that you sign up and get in early. 